Hello, hello to Williams folks everywhere. Welcome, thank you for coming together for this afternoon's program. I'm Pam Franks, the class of 1956 director of the Williams College Museum of Art. And I'm delighted to be here with you today to celebrate Williams Women in Arts Leadership, 50 years of Williams co-education, 50 years of the grad art program, and the Society of Alumni Bicentennial. This panel is one of a year long series of events commemorating the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Williams College Society of Alumni. Our society is the oldest alumni association in North America and quite possibly the world. We're spending this bicentennial year not only celebrating and grappling with our past, but also examining our present and imagining our future. Together, we envision an inclusive society where all alumni feel they belong. We are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to each other and to our college. As we begin the program, we acknowledge a legacy of displacement of indigenous Mohican people from the lands upon which Williams College is built. Williams College resides on the ancestral and spiritual lands of the Mohican people. Each of us comes to this virtual space from all over the country on the traditional land of indigenous peoples. We pay our respect to our indigenous elders past and present by acknowledging our troubled history. Thank you. A few reminders before we get started. If you have questions at any time during today's talk, you can please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We, we will have dedicated time for question and answer at the end of this program. So um, do submit your questions and please know that you can submit them at any time, submit them as you think of them. Please reserve the chat function as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you may have. Remember to select all panelists and all attendees. So, um, and that's in your chat drop down, so that your message can be seen by all. And then finally, please note that today's program will be recorded. And with that, I will introduce our panelists. We are joined today by Lucinda Barnes, a 1978 grad art alumna and curator emerita and former chief curator and director of programs and collections at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Lucinda has been a leader in modern and post-war contemporary art for more than 30 years and is currently proprietor of Lucinda Barnes Arts, specializing in fine art appraisal and consultation. Laura Hopman, Williams class of 1983 and executive director of the Drawing Center since 2018, Laura has been a curator of contemporary art and a leading participant in the international art conversation for three decades. She came to the Drawing Center after eight years as curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art. Jameen Momin, Williams class of 1995, is director of curatorial affairs at the Henry Art Gallery where she oversees the curatorial exhibitions and programs departments. Shamim was adjunct professor for, of contemporary art for Williams College for the 2007-8 semester in New York program and is currently affiliate professor of art at the School of Art, Art History and Design at the University of Washington. Sasha, Shud, excuse me, Sasha Suda is an 05 grad art alumna and director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada where she was appointed in February of 2019. Sasha is passionate about the gallery's ability to serve and resonate with Canadians from coast to coast to coast. She believes that the visual arts have the power to connect the past to the present and that they can help us forge a more inspiring, creative and equitable future. Victoria Sancho Lobos, an O2 grad art alumna, serves at Pomona College as the Sarah Rempel and Herbert S. Rempel Class of 23, Director of the Benton Museum of Art, and as Associate Professor of Art History. Prior to joining Pomona, Victoria worked for the Art Institute of Chicago in a variety of curatorial and administrative roles, including interim chair of the Department of Prints and Drawings. 
And finally, Sarah Needham, Williams class of 2008. Sarah is the executive director of the Hill Art Foundation and operating art foundation in Chelsea, New York. Previously, she was program officer at the Stavros Niachos Foundation, where she led the foundation's US arts and education grant making and worked at the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, where she spearheaded a public art initiative and ran the Young Patrons Group. We're so pleased to have all of you here today. Welcome, thank you for being here. So with that, I, I'd love to just jump right in. Uh, looking at the screen today, you all are brilliant leaders, incredibly capable, could be leaders of any, any type of organization. So I just thought we'd start with why the arts? Why did you choose to dedicate your work and your lives to the arts? And Sarah, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Hi, Pamela, and thank you so much for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm so in awe of all the speakers today and look up to their careers. And Pamela, I've heard a lot about your leadership at WECMA, and we're so lucky to have you there. Um, I, prior to Williams, I trained at the School of American Ballet at Lincoln Center. So dance and the arts were always part of my life. And I think Williams just introduced me to the interdisciplinary nature of the arts um, that, you know, I could be familiar with dance, but also be around theater and the visual arts um, and music. So I, throughout my classes at Williams, I was able to kind of weave in dance um, and really find a love of art history. And for me, there was really no other option other than kind of Find, pursuing a career in the arts. Um, and yeah, I think Williams had a huge impact on that because of all of the um, art museums and opportunities for students, everything from New York City Ballet visiting to the opportunity to perform at Mass Mocha, um, the opening of the 62 Center my freshman year. So there was kind of no question that I needed the arts to be part of my life forever. Fantastic. That's so inspiring, Sarah. Thank you. I love the, I, uh, the, the way that dance brought you to the arts more broadly. How about, how about you, Laura? Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. It's nice to know that um, my uh, uh, old professor from Williams College is tuning in. Carol Ackman, salute to you, Carol. Haven't seen you in a long time. I'd love to see you sometime soon in New York. Um, I always wanted to... Um, be near artists. That was my raison d'etre ever since I was a kid. And I grew up in Washington, DC. So I frequented the National Gallery of Art where there weren't that many living artists uh, around. But um, I also fell in love with the with uh, the work of dead artists as well. So um, I chose Williams College for that exact reason. And there, like Sarah, there was really no question from about age eight or nine years old what I wanted to do with my life. And I was extremely lucky to be able to do that. I think it's really important for um, undergraduates at a wonderful place like Williams College that gives you a, a, like a kind of poo-poo platter of, of liberal arts uh, possibilities. Um, it's enormously helpful if you have a vocation. That is, if you have a deep love that you, um, that you decide upon um, maybe early on in your, uh, your academic career, it's really lucky. Not everybody can do that, but it's a super lucky thing because it really puts you on a um, a trajectory that um, that you can follow. Thank you, Laura. Well, maybe we'll continue on the um, uh, graduates of Williams College track. Shamim, do you want to speak to to why you chose the arts? Sure. Um, unlike Laura, not quite from age eight or nine. I actually, but it was fairly early um, high school. I was on a trajectory, I thought I was going to be a scientist. Um, I was going in the direction of chemistry in my junior year or so. And then I took an art history class, which my wonderfully my high school actually offered. I know that's fairly unusual, but, um, and just kind of fell in love with how uh, broad and complete the study of art could be and that it 
for the first time, I felt like all of the various things that I loved um, exploring in, in school and education in general, and why I wanted to go to a liberal arts college to begin with, would kind of all kind of co coalesced within the study of art. So everything from a history, history of science, politics, um, current affairs, etc. not to mention, of course, the experience of it aesthetically and emotionally. Um, so then I too then chose Williams specifically because of that. And it was sort of a my sneaky thing in my family because I uh, applied early to Williams, which was binding then. I don't know if it is still, but um, so as to not have to have the discussion of why I wasn't applying to I to the Ivies, which is my parents who were first uh, who came were immigrants, um, like many expected me to do. So that was how Williams came into my life, and I'm thrilled about it. And uh, so I went in intending to be an art history major, but how I got to curatorial work um, is a bit later. So we'll talk about that when we get to the Williams part. <laughs> Great, wonderful stories, thank you all. Well, the three of you who are graduates of the MA program must have um, already found your way to the arts by the time you got to Williams. Um, Lucinda, do you wanna talk about how you chose to make a life in the arts? Yes, thank you, Pam. It's really, really a pleasure to be part of this conversation to be invited to join this wonderful group of, of professionals in the field and so many, so many participants today, uh, many friends of many of ours here. Um, like Shamin, I also was very fortunate in high school to um, uh, have an art history class. And my start um, was a great teacher a teacher who really tapped my interest at a point when it was hard to know where where I was going to go. I, uh, you know, I was a teenager. I was having a tough time kind of finding my voice and finding, finding my way. And, and this was it for me. And I think part of part of that teaching was uh, the way in which this this particular teacher uh, enlivened um, the creation of art and brought um, a kind of uh, relatable um, stories to to the arts, particularly in the modern era. And uh, it was it was really at that moment that I decided to to follow the arts. I went to New York University and you know in, in an environment of again great teachers, great museums. And teaching and going to museums became intertwined for me at, at that point, learning in museums. Um, uh, there was a wonderful class taught by Robert Rosenblum and uh, that was quite lively, a class on cubism. And I remember quite distinctly uh, when he would uh, talk about these aha moments uh, in the development of art and use the term eureka or something like this. And from class, I would go to MoMA or I would go to the Whitney or I would go someplace else. So that was, um, that was intricately tied together. And Williams for me, like the undergraduates was a choice because I knew, and I'm glad that they chose me as well. And frankly, I would, and I, I should say, I was introduced to the Williams program, which was quite young uh, at that point by one of my classmates at uh, NYU who had also been in Robert Rosenblum's classes. Um, uh, and he's the one he had was at Williams and introduced me to this idea. So I quickly, I quickly followed. Fantastic. How about you, Sasha? What, what shaped your um, direction into the arts? I think you're on, you might be on mute, Sasha. Am I on mute now? No, great. Well, it's fantastic to be around the table. It's exhilarating, in fact, to hear everybody's stories and you know, so much of it resonates with my own experience. Um, but what I'd say, what I'd add to all these uh, great connections to how we got to art is just, the sense of belonging that art museums in particular have fostered for me um, and for my family growing up. I was, I'm a first generation Canadian 
and always felt like museums were a place where I could go with my parents and and feel a sense of um, expansiveness, you know, that they felt connected to something there uh, that they felt at home. Um, talking about history and where we are right now while we're in those spaces. I mean, of course, that's me looking back now at what that feeling of, of, of belonging and kind of being safe and looking forward to being in these places was and um, putting it in a, in a more contemporary light and, and asking myself why I stay in the art world given all that's happened in the last year plus, um, because that continues to, to drive my work and, and expanding that sense of belonging to a broader community. So uh, that's how I'd, I'd sum up how and why I remain in the art world today and um, why it's such a fantastic and expansive place to be. That's beautiful, thank you. Victoria, what, what moment at which did you make your decision to go into the arts and what prompted that? Um, thanks, Pam. Thank you for the invitation. And I just want to echo what people have said. This is uh, an honor and a pleasure to be sitting amongst you. And thank you for everyone who I'm just captivated by all of the introductions. And we can just subtitle this the Friends of Carol Ackman panel, because I think um, we've we've we get to share her with you New Yorkers since I, she does spend a good amount of time here in Claremont, California, where where I am um, speaking from today. So my story is a little bit like, like Sarah's. I, I grew up playing the cello and in some ways uh, knew around age 15 or 16 that that would not be my vocation where I think it's so nice to think about that idea. And I have felt that, that art museum work has been a calling for me. And as early as my teenage years, I had the good fortune of attending Phillips Academy Andover that has a wonderful museum. And as Sasha was saying, um, you know, I found myself just kind of gravitating back to the space of the Addison um, in between rehearsals or classes. And I was there for openings and went there by myself. And um, I think perceived, although probably at that time couldn't put the words to it, that art museums are spaces where we can look for uh, refuge, inspiration, where we can be challenged about our assumptions or preconceived notions. Um, and where we can create space to um, ideally make a positive impact in our communities and, and more broadly to enact social justice um, globally, we hope. So I think I, I felt that potential from early on and went to Yale knowing I wanted to be an art history major and worked a little bit uh, after college in New York and found myself happily at uh, Williams a couple of years later and just had a, a fantastic time in the program. I'm gonna give a shout out to my friend, Elise Barclay and Lisa Doran and all of our, our buddies who were um, around Williams. And um, I just think this panel is also such a great space to remind each other how critical um, mutual support and mutual aid is, um, particularly as we women look to take on greater roles of leadership in, in the arts and elsewhere. Thank you, really inspiring. I wonder if we could turn the conversation now to specific experiences that might have um, been transformative in your education. Um, moments during your time at Williams when you really clarified your um, goals, your hopes and dreams. Um, Shamim, you started to allude to that in your answer before. Do you wanna kick us off? Sure. I mean, um, my arts education at Williams was obviously utterly critical to everything I was thinking about, but I would say one of the mo most um, important aspects of how, what direction I decided to go in was when I, I spent a year abroad in Paris and I came back um, that summer, I had an apartment off campus or whatever, it was on Spring Street, so I don't know why we called it that, but in any case, um, so I came in early and was trying to figure out what to do uh, for the summer and wanted to, so I went to, to WICMA and asked for a meeting with Linda Shearer, who was the director at the time, um, who kindly gave me one out of, you know, appearing out of the blue, and we just talked about ideas, and that's actually how I discovered 
curatorial work. I know it sounds a little bizarre because I was also a museum associate, so obviously was involved with the museum already, but hadn't really thought about the translation of my education and all the amazing experience with ideas I was having into uh, making things happen in real life, so to speak, how the, my love of communication and working with living artists and all of that could actually be synthesized with everything that I was working on in the classroom um, and become uh, something I could do with my life. So that was really my aha moment to reference that, my eureka moment around what curatorial work could be and how that it then itself could lead to um, down the line, the opportunity to help um, shape and lead a vision within an institution and so on. So um, that's when I made that decision and went uh, to the Whitney, to the Whitney ISB program directly after that year with that intention in mind. So it was a, a wonderful start to, to where I have ended up or have gone, I suppose, thus far. Well, and, and um, fortuitous for all of us. It's great. I think these stories of, of people taking calls and the meetings and the sort of um, light bulb going off in the conversations are, are so important and not to be overlooked. And also stories of mentorship are really, um, I hope gonna come through in this conversation. Uh, Sarah, anything that you wanna share about your Williams experience? Um, yeah, well, when you said mentorship, I, I was Laura Hotman's um, intern in the summer of 2007. So my going into junior year, and there's so much from that summer, like. Laura, I remember you were working with Elizabeth Payton, um, all these artists who I hadn't heard of. And now, anytime I see their name, I think back to that summer. Um, but also a big part of Williams for me, and it's kind of, the network has been amazing, but um, you know, liberal arts being able to take classes in all different fields. I took a lot of education courses with Professor Engel, taught at the Williamstown Elementary School. Um, and kind of, and took a public art class my senior year where we went to Dia and Storm King. Um, and kind of all of that combined has always kind of been with me because I'm very passionate about arts accessibility and arts education. Um, so yes, all the art history classes were amazing, but kind of being able to take classes in all different areas and to shoot an email to, you know, the amazing alumni Base has been hugely impactful um, in my career. Fantastic story, thank you. Well, I think we're gonna follow with you, Laura. Um, I, I think at Williams College, I sort of followed two trajectories. Uh, one was the art history trajectory, and um, I've already mentioned Professor Ackman, who's enormously important not only in classes on 19th century French painting, but on the winter term, beginning my Italian studies, which I, I kept up and spent my junior year abroad in Rome and really has marked the rest of my, rest of my life. But the other, the other thread was, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, living artists. And I had a drawing professor um, called Ed Epping. I don't know if Ed is retired, probably retired, but I, I, I have reconnected with him since uh, 1983. And um, I've always been very proud to uh, remind myself that I got a D in Ed's class. So that I, <laughs> I was not a, I was not a drawer, but certainly a lover of, uh, of drawing and of artists like Ed and, uh, and others. And um, I also got the chance while I was at Williams College and I was trying to remember who it was, but I think it was um, an alumna and somebody who was somehow involved with the Williams College Museum who told me that once I got to New York City, because that's where I was going, I could um, find a job, not necessarily at a museum, but a place where living artists were. And um, I somehow stumbled my way to Franklin Furness, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was a hotbed of performance art work at the time um, on Franklin Street. And that was my first job um, in the arts. I guess I could call it a job because they forgot to pay me. I was also a waitress. But it was um, a moment then that I, I got to meet all the living artists that I wanted to and really began my uh, life in the arts, which um, continued at the Institute of Fine Arts, um, where I was surrounded by great art, great professors, and a lot of dead artists, as well as work downtown where I was uh, surrounded by living artists. And that's um, really um, 
how it went down for me. But the other thing I wanted to say about the class of 1983 being at Williams College in the early 1980s is I really believe that, especially in the art history department, there was really a moment of transition. You had young, um, uh, awake uh, professors like Professor Ackman. And we also, mine was the last year, I believe, I took my 300 course, that is the art history uh, uh, major survey with H.W. Jansen. So he was still, um, he was barely, I think we lost him a year later. But um, that course consisted of, it was probably the opposite of the 19th century French painting course that I took with Carol Ackman. Um, we um, memorized 300 slides. It was just rote memorization. And um, I know this sounds problematic, it was. But I really have to say that my art history vocabulary um, from my uh, from that time at Williams College and uh, that time as uh, with this um, terminally ill professor who would cough, put up a slide, tell us to memorize it, cough again, um, really gave me this um, this visual vocabulary that I've been using for thirty years. That, that's such a. I don't know who H.W. Jansen, Pamela, maybe you need to tell our younger colleagues who H.W. Jansen was. <laughs> Absolutely. I, or, or maybe he's known through, through his um, textbooks. Absolutely. Uh, Sasha, you talked about so beautifully about a culture of belonging. And I wonder if you found a place um, where you felt at home at Williams um, at the museum when you arrived or anything else you wanna share about your Williams experiences specifically that continued that, that uh, role that museums played in your life. Absolutely. And I, I will just still say that Williams town is like still an oasis that I, I'm not sure is a reality or part of my imagination, but it's a place that I kind of st strive to return to on a regular basis where, you know, my, uh, you know, interest in athletics and the outdoors intersects with um, my passion for art and, and serious art history. So I would say that's, you know, for me, what Williams was a place where you know, the, the academy and the museum lived on level playing field and where visiting scholars um, and, you know, academics I'd only really seen the names of in bibliographies from my undergraduate period became humans, you know, who walked up and down the street, the same street I walked up and down on and who were interested in, in kind of what I had to say or the questions that I had to ask. Um, and that, you know, together with the museum piece, and I, I had the amazing mentorship, like many, many um, women who are thriving in the art world right now, including Esther Bell, who's um, chief curator at the Clark, we worked for Jim Gans in the prints and drawings department, prints, drawings and photographs. And that was a place where a lot of the Clark fellows would um, kind of come and look through the collection and we'd make connections and, um, you know, really go deep. Uh, in the museum context, and I and I think I, I still think back to Williams as a place where museums can be uh, a, a serious place for reflection and discourse, a place to go deep, but also to invite a broader audience into that conversation. And uh, you know, I haven't quite experienced a place like it. I think it might be, you know, the the just the the real density of brains and art lovers in a single kind of a single place in the world who come together on a regular basis, sometimes maybe too often. Um, and you, but you, you develop a kind of comfort in, um, in sometimes really easy conversations, but also in tough conversations that, that feel somehow more real because they're in person. So for me, that really shaped, um, my art world experience and it's really encouraged me to stay in touch with people um, and not to kind of stay in a, in a museum bubble. Um, but I also think in art history sometimes the museum is not taken as seriously uh, by the academy and I, I you know or I felt that at certain points in my academic uh, my academic career and I really felt like at Williams it's a place where not only is it respected but museum professionals are encouraged and supported to take it seriously and and um, and I really, really value that. Such a powerful 
image, the notion of names on a bibliography becoming people and then engaging in, in conversation in the present tense in a right at the at the time that you're um, immersing yourself so deeply in your studies. Thank you. Lucinda, any recollections from your time at Williams that were transformative? Um, many like that. I mean, Sasha touched on so many points that um, uh, about the uniqueness of, of the, the graduate program of the community and also the opportunities uh, that were afforded us as graduate students. And I think um, uh, one of the things uh, was this uh, um, approach to the expanded classroom. And that was by having so many visiting scholars and the students in many ways during, um, uh, Frank Robinson was director of the program when I was there. And he, um, uh, I think one of the things that he did um, for all of us was provide as many opportunities as he possibly could. And in that, it, even as students, we were really treated as peers. And uh, I remember being asked, and I don't know if I had a choice of saying yes or no, but uh, being asked, to introduce Dory Ashton when she came to speak. And, you know, it was terrifying, but it was, uh, as you can imagine, but it was so, those kinds of introductions to, to professional life and to colleagues who, you know, to, to sit down at dinner afterwards with Dory and to talk to her about her, uh, her writing, her experiences, um, when I was at, and, and that sort of um, uh, uh, directness was really transformative. It really, um, it, it built our confidence um, as uh, emerging professionals in the field. But uh, in, in my time in the program, I, I was able to create an exhibition that um, that was presented at WICMA with a living artist, George Rickey, who lived in the area. And I, I, I essentially did an internship with him. There was a publication, who does this as, as a graduate student at the time? And further, I was invited to teach, uh, to be a teaching assistant in the, in the I guess it's the 100 level um, of course. And that for me, really was transformative. The students were not much younger than I was. And um, it's not something I expected to be so interested in, but I absolutely fell in love with it. And in the first class, as nervous as I was, um, it, all of these things coming together, the scholars, the museum, the library, the community, the being able to go to any faculty member, audit any class, um, it, was, it was really extraordinary. And I think unlike any um, community I've ever been part of since, but one up that I hold as a model constantly. Couple of things strike me so much. The notion that you, didn't necessarily expect to be enthusiastic or, or um, particularly excited about teaching, but you'd had this teacher in high school who'd made yeah. the whole of, of yeah. art and museum come to life for you. And I love that continuity. And also the, um, the, very, the notion of making and um, sort of taking, being the spokesperson and taking responsibility for the program comes through so beautifully and, and thinking of your introduction of Dory Ashton or making of the exhibition and the internship with George Ricky, it's, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria, how about you? Experiences at Williams that changed things for you? Well, I, I love following Lucinda in this because I'm uh, very happy to also, as you, Lucinda, we're in an academic setting with your museum and we're here at another liberal arts college all the way across the country. And I'm really pleased that I have a faculty position as well as my role here at the museum. Um, there's just so much to say about Williams. I'm a huge booster. I had just a marvelous time. I love hearing everyone's stories. I guess I would just encapsulate um, you know, my experience and part of what I really benefited from by saying that it was just so distinctly intimate and intense. 
Um, I lived at the fort, which I understand has just been renovated. Can't wait to see it. Um, I lived at the fort. We were doing the travel program in the January term of the first year. I was also a TA. I thought I would go for a straight academic career. So I spent both years being a TA and worked closely with EJ Johnson um, as his TA and others. And I babysat for Liz McGowan, who I think is on this call. So just um, how closely we were all uh, relating to one another in and being taken seriously as academics, um, going to those fellows talks every week, going back to the library and reading until 1 a.m. when we were finally kicked out. Um, just so many formative experiences and truly such a special place. Um, so just a lot, a lot to be grateful for. And, and again, Lucinda, I absolutely agree that it's um, the, the, the special elements of the Williamstown environment the master's program, Williams College and its resources provide definitely a continuing source of inspiration, certainly for me in this in this new role here at Pomona College. And congratulations on that new role. What, what an interesting time to um, be new on the job. And I feel that myself having been at Williams for just over two years. Um, so maybe we'll pivot now and think about the future. I wonder um, if you could all share some of your thinking about what the future, what the arts hold for the future and what you're um, trying to accomplish from where you sit to create a better future for all of us. Um, maybe Victoria, do you wanna kick us off on that? Sure. Thanks, Pam. And I know I, I'm eager to trade notes with you um, as we're we're both in the early phases. I'm, I've got your uh, strategic plan up on my desktop, so I'm very eager to hear about your process. We are in such an unusual circumstance here at the Benton Museum of Art. We're in a brand new building that, and today is a milestone for us. Today is the first day that members of the public can make an appointment to come into our galleries. Mm -hmm. So the pandemic has um, been quite remarkable in all the ways that you would anticipate and then some extra ones that have to do with uh, trying to open a new space, learn the space, doing a very slow motion installation of our building and um, now just being able to share um, our, our beautiful building and our exhibitions with members of the public. I think the, um, you know, the pandemic has laid bare uh, anew so many of the profound inequities in our society. And I think we've all been called on to consider how the work that we do in our museums can um, make those injustices more just and to make our communities um, more equally uh, able to access the resources that um, those of us who are, are fortunate to have relative comfort and, and security um, can also have. So we have thought a lot about our exhibition program, of course, and about uh, making museum work itself more transparent and more accessible and to designing um, new and more outreaching pipelines into the museum field so that we can recruit um, younger uh, emerging professionals who can help us reflect the diversity that we want to represent in our collections, in our programs, and certainly um, through our staff makeup as well. So there's a lot of work to do. I'm sure others um, have, have many points to contribute, but it's, it's definitely been a challenging time and also one that spurred me to um, just think very seriously about how museums can um, can be spaces for um, for healing, for um, re-examining some of our um, prejudices, and um, also be sites for celebration and um, inspiration for new generations. Such important work, really inspiring to hear you talk about it. Thank you, Victoria. Sarah, do you want to share any thoughts about your hopes for the future and how you're um, working from your role as an arts leader yeah. to help shape that? So the Hill Art Foundation is a small 
organization in Chelsea and we just opened in 2019. So then having closed for COVID, it's kind of an opportunity for us to reemerge um, and continue to, you know, we're free and open to the public. So many of the panelists talked about, you know, that experience of going to a museum as a teen. Um, and that's something we want young people to come to our space. So we have a program called Teen Curators um, that works with a small group of high school students here in the space every Tuesday. And then they come and work on Saturdays if they want. They're all paid positions, but I'm now working on relaunching that program, finding a new cohort of teens. And it's really based on learning kind of a little bit of art history 101 and also learning about all the different opportunities in the art world from being a registrar to an art handler to working at a gallery or museum. So we've in the past had an amazing array of speakers and gone on field trips, but due to COVID, we haven't been able, we did a bit of a Zoom program last spring, but then we have paused the program. So I'm really eager to get that back up and running um, and hearing everyone talk about you know, the impact of seeing art at a young age has, has me even more encouraged to do so. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Any, any of the um, teens that you've worked with thus far interested in Williams? Yes, although one girl then went to Brown. <laughs> but I've had lots of Williams conversations and lots of interest in liberal arts schools, which is great. That is great. Thank you. Lucinda, what, what are your hopes for the future and what do you think we can uh, do to make them real? There we go. I'll mute myself. Um, I think following on um, other comments, um, you know, about really how we take what we have learned from the past year, the past couple of years um, about inequities, about um, uh, transparency, about um, voices being heard uh, and how, how those issues, how those concerns become um, both part of the conversation that we're having internally, but how how we um, how we are working to build our own internal structures to to uh, be more responsive to this. And mind you, I'm curator emerita at this point, so I'm not in the day to day operations of uh, uh, the Berkeley Art Museum but, and Pacific Film Archive, but still very much. Um, in um, working in collaboration with them and colleagues in other museums. And I'm even, in, and I'm working more on a curatorial level as opposed to managing teams of people, but it, on that curatorial level, thinking, thinking of how we go about, um, how we investigate new ideas, how we bring voice to new ideas, and how we make those, how we um, um, bring to fruition ideas in manners, in ways um, that address the issues that are of concern to us today, and how we really, how we strengthen our institutions. Um, one of one of the big issues for me, because I, I have been on the operational side of curatorial work um, in so much of my career as chief curator, and at that level is not only are we asking uh, and improving how we care for our communities, our collections, our infrastructures are our communities as well. And um, many of us, many of our institutions have reduced staffs reduced resources, um, but the, the care for the collections, the care for our colleagues, um, that doesn't go away. So we, we really have to be, um, I think vision has an operational side. Uh, and, uh, and I think we have to keep that balance in mind. Okay. 
I will say here, here too, vision has an operational side. I think realizing the opportunities, realizing the vision is, um, can be more challenging than it appears if we're doing our jobs right. And it's this year, this past year has really highlighted um, some of those uh, challenges, obviously. So thank you for that. Shamim, your, your vision for the future and how are you making it happen? Well, I, I appreciate being able to follow on that because uh, that vision has an operational side is really one of the ways in which um, I've always hoped to function when I first began, when I left the Whitney Museum where I was for 12 years following Williams, um, I moved to LA to start a public arts organization, something akin to um, Creative Time for those of you who know uh, that organization, our production fund and so on, but LA oddly didn't have one purely dedicated to, the, um, to public audiences and the public realm work. I think um, it was, sort of key to me to think about what were the ways to take mission statements and vision statements, all of which were even then very admirable and thoughtful, but actually create structures that reflected those accurately, uh, which is very hard to do at a, at a large institution like the Whitney, no doubt, but it, it, being able to create um, the internal workings and systems for the organization I started called LAND, um, in Los Angeles that were reflective from the get-go, at least we try, we're working towards that, of our goals. And that can be everything from, um, you know, we've talked a bit about content in our curatorial work, our collections, um, and some have referred to our internal structures. I think that that has to be parallel too. And that's what a lot of the work that I'm seeing needs to be done in many institutions, including my own here at the Henry, but being able to create the, uh, the structures, the process, the vendors that you use, the way in which you pay, the way in which you hire, how those are built into those systems, um, that is a really nitty gritty nuts and bolts uh, work to do. And it's not, one can have the best vision um, out there and the most equitable one, but until it's really enacted in every single decision, which is exhausting, frankly, but it's necessary, um, it's, not, it's not truly, uh, a true accessibility or a true diversity. And one of the great things, so what I'm finding here um, in Seattle at the Henry, um, before COVID and everything that was brought even more to light in this past year, uh, one of the reasons it was appealing to me as a, as, a, as a community is just, it is already an extraordinarily progressive, thoughtful place. And um, I was really struck by how deeply a lot of the DEAI work and the internal investigation and like self-reflection was already happening at the Henry. Um, I'd like to think because I was able to participate in the strategic plan right when we began and we're continuing to revise it that we're finding new and uh, better hopefully ways to unpack that and put those into place. Um, and some have been very directly inspired by our needs, the needs that came to the fore during COVID. Um, we pivoted as Meant, as everywhere else, we were closed, but we turned then towards the strategic plan priority of our deep relationships with the community and our audience, which we've always prioritized, but not to the degree we were able to do this past year. Um, and I hate when people say silver lining because there is no silver lining per se to this past year, but the things that we learned from turning towards our publics, our audiences, our different ways of, of really thinking carefully about what that means to have those relationships and build them in an ongoing way um, where they're reciprocal and not, look, we're doing this nice thing for you, which can often be the notion of community and partnership. Um, so really digging into that, I, I, I would say, has, has been one of the most significant aspects of this last year and how we'll continue to embrace that as part of our programming and, and um, strategizing going forward. Um, I'm sure there are so many other things, but I'll leave it at that. That's a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Shamim. I really appreciate the um, commitment to uh, being a learning community and to the ongoing value of the, of the lessons that we're learning in this moment and how that can, can shape um, how we move forward. I'm also so struck by the resonances um, between your description of work at the Henry and specifically work around inclusivity and equity at the Henry and 
um, and that at WICMA. And I think there's a, something really special about museums in academic environments that um, that is uh, an exciting opportunity for all of us, um, but for those of us in academic environments to connect across. And uh, this was um, really coming through loud and clear in Victoria's comments too. How about you, Laura, from the point of view of the Drawing Center or MoMA before, uh, very different types of institutions, what do you see as the important um, things to be thinking about for the future and um, strategies for making them realities? Well, I think that, that um, I agree with everybody that um, this past uh, 15 months has really been for our field a reset button. We cannot go back to where we were uh, before. And I think I can say that with full heart as a director of a very small institution and as an ex-employee for a very large corporate institution, which was the Museum of Modern Art with 887 um, uh, employees. And I think um, what I um, have learned in that transition and that uh, between the, one of the largest, most powerful and richest uh, museums in the world to a, a smaller institution, a very, very small institution that's been embedded in the community for 44 years is that there are strengths to both of them and uh, to, both, to both models. Um, but I can say that the ability to move quickly to realize and listen and change on a dime is something that um, the smaller institutions, those institutions that are more fleet of foot, if institutions have feet, um, can do. And I appreciated it enormously because um, the drawing center is, um, I can't say that it, it comes from a model, a, a liberal model that started in the middle of the 1960s um, that, um, that transferred money from the federal government to local uh, city and state governments. And in New York, it created this efflorescence of not-for-profit organizations, often artist run and uh, artist founded. The drawing center was founded by a, an assistant curator from the Museum of Modern Art. And that, that sort of impetus um, that connects the history of art with the, um, the, the vital everyday living, vital everyday um, needs of living artists is something that the Drawing Center is um, very much devoted to. That said, the community, the, the visual arts community, the ecosystem in New York had been a, a very exclusive one um, forever, if you will. And, uh, and now with these um, ruminations, uh, especially in the larger institutions, what you're seeing is the actuality of some of these, some of the absolutely needed changes, not just to program, that was easy enough, but to uh, something as simple as, as internships, for example, paying an intern a living wage is an, uh, is an issue of, of the greatest importance in terms of equity, as are paying our staff members living wages. Um, this is something that opens up the, the field to uh, the possibility of people from all walks of life um, joining us in these, in these endeavors. And these things have been implemented in the past 15 months, if you will, across the board, as far as I can see, uh, at least in my, in my city. And this is, um, without the connection, the very important lifeline and connection to funding sources. And I think that this is an extremely important issue because for smaller institutions like my own, where we don't have, um, for example, um, uh, we're free and open to the public, we are able to, to change our policies in a much more significant way quicker than those institutions that are attached to the lifeline of, of, of admissions, for example, to keep their operations going. Um, concomitantly, the, um, our donor base is smaller than, a, of course, a large institution like the Museum of Modern Art or the Met or the Whitney or places like that. And um, therefore, we are able to be, if you will, um, choosier. Is that a possibility? It, it's, it's, it almost seems counter, counterintuitive, but um, for the community that we create, not only our funder community, our donor community, our the community that sits on our board, um, we can... Um, shape that as much as we can shape our visitorship as well as the, uh, the people who come to, the people who participate in, in our programs like our, like our artists. So I guess what I'm saying is that um, this past 15 months have made us all take the wheel as directors more than, than I think we ever, ever had. But we, we realized that um, 
that we didn't have to go on the on the prescribed road or and maybe veer off a little bit if we were going to change the world in a way but now the road has been occluded completely and that we have to forge our own new ones and it excites me to think that that our field will be so ever more changed and different uh, as of as of as of now and i really do think that that will be different personnel different uh, areas of intensities I mean, who would have thought in uh, 1983 in Art History uh, 301 um, that there would be uh, curators of inclusivity, um, that kind of, uh, uh, of positions that uh, would become available and that would have been dreamed up in these past uh, few years, for example. And these are things that, that um, when we looked at our field as an iconic entity, the history of art, the history of Western art, which uh, so exclusive and didn't didn't allow for the kind of dreams that we're dreaming now. Who would think that um, that it would crumble uh, like it did? Like a lot of, um, uh, I guess you could say, uh, teleologies. To quote Kurt Tauber, <laughs> an old professor of mine at Williams uh, College. But uh, yes, in fact, so these opportunities have really have really happened in in culture in the United States. On, uh, on, uh, on every level and it's up to us to seize those opportunities, whether in a writ large or writ small. And I guess what I'd like to advocate for is um, there is power in smallness. There is power in depth as opposed to breadth in terms of growth. That's inspiring. And I, for one, am so grateful that you're taking the wheel, Laura. And I'm also so grateful as you are uh, driving the car on a road that doesn't go any direction you ever expected it to go, that you have a lifetime of being inspired by artists and by working with artists, because it's exactly this kind of imagining a future that um, didn't, doesn't exist yet. That is the creative work of, of making positive change. And, and thank you. Sasha, I think we're coming full circle here. You started us off with beautiful remarks about museums as important to you because they fostered a, a sense of belonging. And I wonder if you wanna talk about um, your vision for the future and what you're doing at the National Gallery of Canada to make that more of a reality. Well, so first of all, mic drop for you, Laura, that was amazing. Thank you so much, um, and to everyone, because it's it's there. I mean, I think we've just heard what the future of the art world looks like and, and many, many more perspectives to be included that aren't around this table, but people who are really listening. And I think listening is the key and and really like what we're here to do, and we've been here to do for over, you know, 150 years is to bring joy and to lift um, I'm not going to say to lift society. I think it's to be part of a society that lifts itself, lifts everyone within it. And I think, you know, we're, we're coming to terms with the fact in this reset that a lot of people don't feel joy when they come through the thresholds to our organizations. And, and we're woefully behind on, on keeping up with the changing society within which we claim to be, right? So, we talk a lot about leading society. I think I was asked on a panel, how do we get back there? Let's just try to be part of society and be the part that brings joy, that builds bridges. Uh, and I think part of the challenge there is, is to celebrate at the same time as we interrogate, right? To acknowledge and heal while we forge ahead with ambition and excitement. Um, and that's, that's walking quite a tightrope, right? Because even I'm sometimes afraid to, to celebrate a moment because I think it right now we're in this moment of pause and I think that's the right thing to do, but it's, it's, it's actually requiring courageous leadership, not at just the, the leadership level. We have so much privilege at, in my office. I, I mean, I, I can see the horizon line. There's so many people within the organization who don't see the same hope and, and, and the horizon line that's moving back. And so how do I provide them hope and, and have access to their ideas, right? That, that actually are there, but it requires, you know, the leadership to challenge certain assumptions. So I'll just share an example, which is 
We have a team of extraordinary Indigenous curators. Um, Canada as, as a society is on a path towards reconciliation with its Indigenous peoples. And our team has been doing amazing programming. But that programming has had to sort of shoehorn its way into our, into our mandate, into our budgets, into our operational structure, and into the program calendar. But as it shoehorns its way, and it's becoming the thing we're known for. And when we really listen, then the ideas are so expansive and have the potential to transform us. So to Shamim's point about reciprocity, yes, rep reciprocity is everything. So this team came forward to me, you know, two days after I joined the organization and said, yeah, we want to collect Indigenous art, but we want it to be um, part of a reciprocal agreement with community. So rather than us buying something, well, let's commission something as we build a collection of historical Indigenous objects. So I said, okay, a historical object is not commissioned. That's something that exists that comes to us from community and we can celebrate that history. And they said, yeah, well, in the co colonial framework, yes. But for us, it's about reaching out, working with community to identify which objects belong um, as part of a narrative, and then working with them to recreate those objects, not take them out of community, but recreate them. And while we're doing that, we're also going to support that community in, in revitalizing those traditional methods of making, which we've abolished through colonial settler practice. Right, and, and so you can imagine the conversation with certain curators, assumptions about acquiring. It's original, it's excellent. It belongs to us. We, cre we create the terms on which it enters and stays within the collection. Um, there are certain re operational requirements for this thing. How, how can we control that? I mean, those things seem like big, big, big questions until you say, yeah, let's go for it. And you create the systems to make it to make it work. And as you can imagine, each project is different. It requires us to build new relationships. It requires relational ways of working. It starts to dismantle some of the really kind of old school ways of working that we have. And, and it requires more expansive thinking. Um, and, and frankly, it requires me to have a partner in thinking with me because I, you know, we also have to stop assuming that we can speak on the behalf of the communities that we exist to serve. So, you know, I, I get to celebrate that moment with the team who has been thinking about this, not for the last year, but for the last 20 years, right? And finding a way to center that within the organization means other things will get pushed off the desk. And I think that's the hard part. That's the part as leaders that we should really be engaged in to make sure there's a soft landing for those things that aren't you know, our central tenants and assumptions around our existence. Um, but I, I, I think it's an extraordinary journey we're on and there's a lot of joy in it. Um, so that's what I think. I see joy and lift on the other end. And I see somebody who looks and sounds a lot different from me um, that I'm a placeholder for in this role right now. Thank you so much. That is um, so, so full of hope and joy in itself. And I, I'm really appreciative of your, um, your call to listen and um, your uh, sort of avocation of the many times that reciprocity has come up in this conversation. And, and thank you for starting us off on that, Shamim, as well. We have a little bit of time for questions from that are coming in from the audience, and I think I'll I'll just um, kick it off with a question from Catherine White. And if there's someone on the screen who would like to answer the question, we don't necessarily need to go all the way around on these questions so that we can get to as many as we can. Uh, we'll try and approach it that way. So Catherine has um, asked. I'm interested that most of you were exposed to art history or the performing visual arts in high school. That's great. But how might places like Williams engage students in the arts when they've had no prior experience? Does anybody wanna take that question? Well, I'll, I'll start and I'm sure I won't, I won't say too much. I'm sure others have thoughts. I think one of the exciting things about a museum at um, in a college setting or in a university setting is that we have the opportunity to be someone's 
you know, first museum experience or their, their home museum institution. And uh, we also have the chance to galvanize the energies of our students um, following their interests. And so we've, um, like Sarah mentioned, we've, we've kept up our internship program, which I'm very pleased, as Laura said, is entirely paid positions. Um, all our labor here is, is paid, compensated. Um, and we've had students really, you know, exert their, their commitments and their intellectual interests through projects um, like a workshop we're developing for undocumented um, teens that's related to our current cross-border photography exhibition, um, like um, a, an exhibition that some of our students did that really questions assumptions that we bring to museum space. So I think for those of us who are fortunate enough to um, work in institutions nested in um, liberal arts colleges or universities, we have this kind of built in opportunity to meet students where they are. And um, I'm trying to, to kind of go around to all the student interest groups and we have something called sponsor groups and certainly um, I hope, you know, embed the idea that this is our museum, not just museum staff, you know, bringing something to them, um, but that our work is made meaningful here through the participation of our student and faculty community. I might build on that just again as a Universe, well, half, I don't really know how you define us exactly because we are half of 501c3 and half embedded within UW, but certainly the campus community is our core, is a core audience for us um, and beyond. So we, we similarly have programs that are intended to invite and appeal to students across multiple disciplines to be involved with the interpretation of the institutional presentation. So. Uh, a program actually that began in the course of COVID. I mean, we'd applied for it before, but it kind of took on an entirely new tenor um, this past year, our liaison program, where um, I think only one of the, of the students participating in it is from School of Art. And they are, their charge is to kind of rethink um, how you might communicate about the artwork in the institution. So not a tour guide program in the traditional sense, but really what are other voices of um, interpretation, accessibility and so on, what can they offer? And they're just, um, and we left it deliberately quite open as what those formats might be. And it became especially possible this year because there was no standard format because there was no gallery specifically. And really seeing how, how broadly they're thinking and how creatively they're approaching the question has been exciting and, and I hope to you know continue to expand that. Um, and then from another from a sort of younger perspective because the, the question was uh, around high school specifically and some of our own um, advantages of, of being exposed to certain things earlier on. Um, you know, I think a lot of museums have teen programs that are similar to to ours. I know the Whitney had one as well that was uh, quite early on in its endeavors this way but to really kind of create art programming for uh, schools or districts that may not have um, as much funding for such things within their um, educational systems at the time. Um, one of the things I particularly love about our teen program, it's an, it's an application program like many, but um, the teen group from each year chooses the next, selects from the applications for the next year. And so it creates a really strong um, community and, and continuity of its own. I mean, they're alumni, they have their own um, events and things like that and continue to stay in touch. Um, and that's, that's one of the strongest um, elements to that program that I would just wanna share as, as a way to keep, to create this ongoing engagement. Um, if I can just mention something that um, uh, that has been quite successful in Berkeley is um, a student, um, a student, it's not an advisory committee, it's a student committee in which um, the students, it really is like what you're talking about, you mean with a membership and alum and they inform one another and it really, it's a generative process of students reaching out to other students to get them involved in the museum. And this, this has 
you know, when students were on campus. Um, uh, this has been very successful um, for the Berkeley Art Museum, both in terms of the, the museum curatorial programs and the film programs. And um, the student committee also, uh, we had, there would be one or two representatives from the student committee um, representing them on the board of trustees at the board of trustees meeting. So, so having that voice, both want to develop their own programs and a lot of it is socially based, but, but it is to make that um, with the intent of the museum being the place, the gathering place and the, the students developing their own programs, but also being part of the museum structure with, with voice on the board and, um, and within the internal structure of the institution. It was very, very um, successful. Terrific, thank you, all three of you. We have just a few more minutes. I think I'll try to get to a couple of more questions. Um, we have a question from Nari Viner. The old guard art mafia are men since Williams was only men until the 1970s. How have you navigated as Williams women art mafia members? I don't know if you count yourself as those or not, but love to hear about it. Um, factoring partners, children, geographic preferences and so forth. Anybody wanna take that? Well, Victoria, <laughs> Victoria asked me early in the private chat, she was like, how are your twins doing? And my response was, they're not here, hooray. Um, so it's certainly, I mean, I love them and adore them. And and I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's a factor, you know, I think, and it's really nice, you know, I, you don't really think about it until you're around the table with a group of women who have done so much and not all, also assuming that everyone has children or has chosen the same kind of, um, you know, path in their personal lives. but just, it just is nice to see the kind of strength and, and mutual support. I think Victoria opened with saying that the mutual support around the table. Um, and I feel that in spades. I've, I certainly, um, you know, I don't know that I feel part of a Williams mafia per se, but it's pointed out now and then, and there are many more women around me in that mafia uh, currently than there, than there are men, um, not just in this in, in this forum but but otherwise as well so it's um i think it, it's an it's an interesting question um because it's uh it's it's the future right i mean the art world in leadership needs to have a a closer look at intersectionality not just gender and how um how we position ourselves um as a community uh trying to interact with the outside world so I'll leave that there. Thank you. I might just try to combine a few questions for our last question. There are a number of folks who are asking whether you have advice for early career curators and art historians post Williams, um, what you might say to graduating um, students about getting a foot in the door um, or any guidance in these um, early career moments for emerging arts leaders? I do. <laughs> um, art is everywhere. And that means that you could do what you want to do and do what you love to do anywhere. It doesn't, I mean, that's one of the, one of the lessons of the, uh, of, the, of the shutdown, the world shutdown, but also something that's been coming for a very, very long time, which is the decentralization of the notion of culture. You can be in a big place, in a small place. You can be in a community in the United States. You can be in a community that where you don't even speak the language. But um, it's enormously important to recognize and understand, to realize that that um, this kind of joy that Sasha spoke about, which I I treasure so much, that notion can happen all over the world. Speaking from someone who spent almost her entire career in New York City, with a small diversion to Pittsburgh for three years to do the Carnegie International. It's wonderful. I love my city. It's been absolutely great. But it is one of many, many nodal points where um, great culture is happening, where great culture is being made, and where artists live. Thank you. 
Thank you, Laura. Sarah, any, any advice for emerging professionals? I mean, call up the network of Williams, of course. Um, and like Laura said, art is everywhere. And you, know, you don't have to live in New York, you can live all around the world um, and really build your career and, and take on more opportunity maybe if you're not in a big city where there's so much competition. Um, but art is, there's so many community organizations um, and ways you can work in the arts. Um, and also whatever your first job is, does not need to be, you know, I worked in the performing arts, now I work in the visual arts and that can continue to change. So just taking on new opportunities with people that, you know, I always think it's important to work for someone who you really respect and whose career you look up to. That's fantastic advice. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. We are coming to the end of our time. We've actually reached the end of our time together. Thank you. This has been inspiring. We really appreciate you taking time from your busy days and from all of the obviously really critically important work that you're doing um, for the arts and for audiences everywhere. Thank you all for tuning in to this session. It's been great to have such a robust uh, group of, of uh, audience members and really uh, showcasing the strength of the Williams community. It, it's a delight to be here together with all of you. And I just want to remind you that there are more conversations, workshops and programs that will be part of the Society of Alumni Bicentennial and more, um, of course, through the Williams College Museum of Art. Please check those out. We hope, we hope to see you um, at, at many of those coming up. And, and again, thank you so much to all of you panelists. This has, been, this has just been a fantastic conversation and really inspiring. So grateful to you all for your insights and your time. Thank you so much. It's delightful to be here. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for very much. Very inspiring group. Thank you. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Pam, you're a rock star. Yep. Yes. Great to see you all. <laughs>